The story I'm sharing with you here took place in North Carolina in 2021. However, I'm currently living in and writing this to you from southern West Virginia, which is also where I was living when the encounter happened. The weekend in question, or rather, the weekend this happened, I had headed south to an area in the vicinity of the Great Smoky Mountains for a solo camping trip. Stuff was happening for me personally at this time in my life, and I needed to be alone to get away from some things and clear my head. Also, I seriously needed the fresh air after being basically cooped up for the last two years or so. So I drove down Friday night and had an uneventful first evening setting up camp, and then I headed to bed early. I got up early the next morning and I didn't waste any time heading out since I wanted to beat most of the midday heat of summer. All was good for a while until I was hiking up a steep trail and huffing and puffing. When I stopped to catch my breath, I saw an off-leash dog way off in the distance. At first, it didn't even really register with me, but it was coming my way, and as it got closer, I became aware of how much larger it was than other dogs usually are, and also how it was moving along using only its back legs. It had reddish-brown fur, and it was massive, easily the size of a bear, but by the way it was standing, I was totally confused. I looked around to see if anybody else was on the trail, but I was the only one. It was just me, and this thing, standing on this mountain trail in the middle of nature. Nobody. No help. Anywhere in sight. The fear started to set in as I began to fully understand the seriousness that this could be a dangerous situation. I didn't know what this creature was, and I had no idea if it would attack me. Thoughts started creeping into my mind of all the things that might possibly happen. But I stood my ground, and I didn't flinch, hoping that if I didn't make any movement, it would just go away. Now don't think I was being brave by doing this. I actually could not have moved at all, even if I had wanted to. And then soon, it was right next to me. I remember thinking that this must be it. I was going to die. That it was going to kill me. But then it stopped just a few feet away and it simply looked at me. Well, stared at me is more like it. I was looking back into its piercing eyes and I swear it was talking to me with them. In that moment, I knew it could think. Just like us. I just knew it. I could sense it. And also, now it didn't seem mad just curious, like the way a dog would come running up to you frantically and then just stop and look at you. And then just like that, it turned around and it walked away. But it didn't retreat on the trail. It left the trail and it headed out where I soon lost sight of it. That's when my other senses kicked in and now I could smell it too. It smelled like sulfur. And the smell came rushing in so strongly that I had to choke back vomiting right there on the trail. I then sat down for a while right in the middle of the trail to catch my breath, and I tried to make sense of what had just happened. My head was exploding, and I must have looked insane at this point. I just kept thinking how a dog creature, not a real dog by any stretch, but some weird creature had just walked up to me and looked at me, like it knew me, like we were friends or something. It was more than obvious to me that this creature could have easily killed me, and yet it didn't even seem at all like it wanted to do that. I think it just wanted to see me up close or something. Check me out. Even though I can't remember every second of it, I still can't get it out of my head. It comes back to me in waves, like flashbacks. The whole encounter probably only lasted a minute or two, but looking back on it, it felt like it happened in slow motion, taking forever. And in some ways, I even find myself doubting that it happened. Right afterwards, I took a huge drink of water, basically skeptical of my own eyes and thinking that maybe I had hallucinated due to dehydration. After that, I turned around, headed back to my campsite and fixed lunch and hung out a bit. But in the end, I decided not to stay another night. So I packed it up and I headed back home. I still can't say for sure what that creature wanted. All I know is that I'm still alive to tell the tale which means it wasn't mad or angry. Either way, I'm just glad it didn't kill me. That would have been the end of the story. But instead, I lived to tell the tale. 
This happened in 2018 when I was camping with my family near Superior National Forest in Minnesota. We had camped near the forest before. The last time was maybe two years prior. We were going to meet up with my aunt and uncle, and they were bringing my cousins, too. We ended up packing so much in the car. It wasn't so bad at first, but after a few hours, we were feeling like sardines. I've never been so happy as to see a campground in my life. We checked in, drove to the site, and started to set up tents, unpack our gear. We were there an hour before my aunt and uncle found us. We grilled burgers that night, and I had eaten way too much, so I decided to go for a walk to walk it off, and I found myself walking one of the many trails in the area. The brush was very green, slightly overgrown, apparently from a wildfire a few years prior. Everything kind of grows crazy after, according to the rangers. Well, there weren't too many other people on the trail, and I wasn't really paying attention, just enjoying the surroundings. And then at one point, I thought I heard something in the breeze, like a very light whispering of words. I kept walking for about 20 minutes, and then I heard something again. And this time I stopped and I stood still, trying to listen. I looked around, trying to see if there was somebody else on the trail. But I was alone. I noticed that it was very quiet, too. I didn't hear any birds or see anything moving around. And then I heard the noise again and it sounded like light whispering right around me. I looked around again, but there still wasn't a soul. I heard the whispering get louder, but it was weird because it wasn't really words. It almost sounded like sentences were being formed. And that's when I first saw it, a pale light off in the distance. I began to walk down the trail slowly, getting closer to the light. And when I got to about within 20 feet or so, it blinked out. And then I heard the whispering again. I didn't know what to think, so I just stood there, looking around. And then another light in the shape of an orb then appeared about 30 feet from where I was standing. And then another, about 20 feet to my left. I tried walking left, and the light blinked out. I turned around and then tried to walk up to the second light, but it suddenly blinked out. So now I'm starting to sweat and get goosebumps. And then when I began to hear the whispering again, it was getting louder and louder. I finally turned around and started walking the way I had come, and that's when another orb appeared right in front of me. I started to run, and I swear two or three more appeared in the corner of my eyes as I ran down the trail. I didn't get far. I was running maybe 10 or 15 minutes before I ran into a couple on the trail, heading towards the lights. I guess I looked kind of crazy because the looks they gave me spoke volumes. I stopped, and I watched them walk off down the trail, and I just waited, thinking that I would see them coming back, running towards me. But they never did. Now I didn't see any lights or hear any of the whispering, so I just kind of stood there, dumbfounded, and wondering what just happened. I decided to just walk straight back to the campsite. I don't know what happened or what I experienced in those woods. I walked back to camp and sat down with my family and acted like nothing happened. I brought them to the same trail the next day. We walked the whole thing. Nothing happened. I ended up going back to the area myself, alone, after that. But still, nothing. No light orbs, no whispering, nothing. We haven't been back there since, but I always wonder about those woods and what it was that I saw on that trail. I'm a park ranger stationed in the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. I became a ranger five years ago to live out my dream of spending my days in the rugged beauty of the mountains. However, I recently requested to be placed on strict desk duty. The thought of going back out there, well, I'll probably never go out again. Let me explain. The Green Mountains aren't exactly a tourist hotspot. Most vacationers tend to drive through on their way to Lake Champlain, and that was just fine with me. I felt a sense of kinship with the folks who did visit, and I always enjoyed my time speaking with them on the trail. And that's why, even as I finished a shift one late afternoon and a call went out for a missing hiker, I turned right around and headed back into the mountains to help find the lost man. 
He was in his late 40s and had become separated from his two teenage sons along one of the more demanding trails. He had hung back to rest while they went ahead to explore. But when they returned, he had just vanished without a trace. Night was falling and a rescue copter wouldn't make it out until the morning. Unless he was seriously hurt, he would probably be just fine. But I saw an opportunity to help, so I took it. Father above knows that I wished I hadn't. I kept a full pack in my truck, and after confirming the search grid, I headed off on my own. Since I was technically off-duty, I wasn't a part of the official roster, so I volunteered to check out a few locations where I thought he might most likely be. About two hours later, night had completely fallen, and I had had no luck. I figured I would start making my way back to the service station and call it a night. But on the way back, I thought I heard someone calling out from deep in the forest. I headed in the direction of the voice, but as I approached it, It abruptly cut off. I was puzzled and a little worried that something had happened, but the voice cried out again, hundreds of yards away, but now from the completely opposite direction. I once again trekked toward the voice with the same conclusion, but the voice cut off again. This was very disturbing, to say the least. There was no way someone would have been able to change positions that quickly, especially in the dark. I called out several times, but I received no response. I decided to keep moving and continued down the trail, but just a few minutes later, I heard the same calling sounds. I decided to keep still this time and see what happened. The voice cried out several times, but I remained stationary and silent. Several seconds lapsed and the cry came again, this time closer, and now with a more desperate edge to it. Something felt wrong. I don't know what, but some gut instinct told me to continue going down the trail. So I did. Apparently, the voice didn't like this. I had gone maybe 30 yards down the trail when the cry came again, this time coming from the place I had been moments before. But this time, the voice was angry, not shouting for help, but rather demanding that I stop. I didn't, and instead, I began running. A shriek of rage pierced the night air, and I felt a violent tremor rip throughout the forest floor. I was sprinting down the trail, and the voice continued its constant shrill wail. And then another one came from my right, followed by a third from my left. All throughout the forest, a chorus of voices was screaming in that same wrathful tone, screaming for me to stop and then to come back. At this point, I had no idea where I was, and each direction I headed seemed wrong. In this moment, I felt a fear like nothing I had ever had before. And now the screams were losing their humanity, transforming into something sinister, like a manifestation of hate and fury. And then another scream from just ahead on the trail. I skidded to a halt, and I snapped my flashlight forward. There stood an immense black form roughly the shape of a man, but ten feet tall. It was shimmering like it was fighting to be both there and not there at the same time. I stood still but a moment, and then the thing was racing towards me. I cut from the trail into the forest, running like I was in a sprint. Low branches were whipping at my face, and within minutes I felt the sting from half a dozen small cuts and scrapes. Even here off the trail, the screams continued, increased even. Every few minutes, I saw another shadow out of the corner of my eye, or I caught one in the haze of my flashlight beam. I zigzagged through the forest. Twice I felt the presence of a creature as I rushed past. I could feel a grasping hand fall just short of grasping my arm or my leg, and then the trees would erupt with another screech of fury. And so went the entirety of a long night filled with these unspeakable horrors. For hours I ran through the woods. The screams filled the forest throughout the long night. A moment didn't pass without me hearing it. Other things happened, but I can't bring myself to put those on paper. Not yet. I made it out. Somehow, I made it. I wouldn't be writing this if I hadn't. As the light grew slowly in the sky, the screams faded. The swiping of clawed fists disappeared and the shadows diminished. Until finally, everything was gone. By a miracle, I had ended up in a location that I knew. 
and it was only a two-hour walk to find help. When I eventually made it out of the forest and found aid, I was taken to a hospital in Burlington, and I was treated for numerous minor injuries. I even received several visits from my supervisor, and when questioned, I simply told him that I had gotten lost in the forest and had panicked. I'm a seasoned outdoorsman, and my tail received disbelieving looks and some questioning. But in the end, it was dropped, and I was left to just recover in peace. If I had told the truth, I would probably be placed on leave, which, as I think of it, might not have been a bad thing. It's been two weeks now. The missing hiker is still nowhere to be found. I hope he's still alive, but deep down, I know. I know that whatever is out there found him. As for me, I'm still here just shuffling papers across my desk with no plans at all to head back out there. Growing up, I always thought my grandparents were a little strange. When I was in grade school, I would spend the summers with them at their home in rural Georgia. But my grandpa passed when I was 11, so my memories of him are sparse but I do remember him always reminding me to never, ever whistle when I went into the forest. Every time I went outside, he would tell me this. Country folk around those parts can be superstitious for no apparent reason, so I never gave it much thought. It wouldn't be until many years later when I finally figured out what he was warning me about. I had taken a job with the Forest Service during the summer of 2007. We were clearing some wooded areas for a couple of new roads for more public access into state lands. They were forest roads, so they didn't need to be perfect. But it was hard work, regardless. We had trailers on site to stay in during the project if we wanted. About half the crew lived in the trailers that summer, me included. Strange things happened around the job site all summer. Nothing terrible. No one was hurt, but it was just odd. Things would move at night. We would hear strange sounds after dark. Some of the guys said they had odd dreams, but the weirdest thing that would happen was the voices. We would hear voices calling out to us from the forest at night, telling us to come outside. And if that wasn't strange enough, the voices we heard were those of people we knew, often our co workers. At first, we thought it was just an elaborate set of pranks that no one would fess up to. We all had different ideas of who was behind it, and none of us agreed. After about six weeks of this happening every night, we were fed up. Tempers were high, and work had become miserable. And then one night after work, when I was sitting outside my trailer with a couple of my co-workers, I heard a voice calling from the forest. This had become a regular occurrence around here, but this time... The voice calling from the forest was mine. My co-workers both looked at me. We had all heard the voice, and its source was definitely not me. Either one of our crew was a damn good mimic, or there was something else going on around here. I got up and I walked to the edge of the tree line. I couldn't see anything out there at all. My co-workers tried to get me to come back to the trailer, but I had to know what it was. Some part of me hoped it was just another one of our co-workers being stupid, but deep in my gut, I knew it wasn't that. I went maybe 15 feet into the forest before I had to turn back. Could have been intuition, or it could have just been my own fear. For whatever reason, I wanted to get out of there. I backed out of the forest, not wanting to turn my back on whatever was out there. I turned around when I got to the clearing, and I headed back towards the trailer. My co-workers were both standing in the doorway, and then we heard the voice again. My voice. I had enough of this. I went to the other trailers and I checked on the rest of the crew. No one was missing, which meant none of us could have been in the forest. I could tell the rest of the crew was freaked out. They heard the voice too, and they watched me go into the woods, looking for it. We were finally all in agreement that this was no friendly prank. There was something going on here, and it felt like something bad. Not a single one of us had any ideas on what it could be, and without knowing what we were dealing with, there wasn't a whole lot we could do. I know it sounds stupid, but we decided to just lock ourselves in our trailers and go to bed. 
There were two or three people per trailer, so at least none of us were alone. We bolted the front door shut and we all tried to pretend we weren't afraid. I could tell the other guys wanted to talk about it, but none of us had any ideas, so we just didn't. Night was beginning to fall, but no one would be sleeping well that night. I had almost forgotten about my grandfather and his warnings. It was such a distant memory, but then, out of nowhere, I heard a whistle. It was definitely coming from outside. I opened the window and listened for it again. It was coming from the forest. I knew I should have listened to my grandfather, but I couldn't stand it. I had to know what was out there. And when I heard it whistle, I knew I could call it out. I waited a moment, weighing my decision before I whistled back. Not five seconds passed before I got a response. I whistled again. It whistled back at me. The sound of the whistling began to grow closer and closer to the trailer until finally the creature came into view. At first I thought it was a ghost. It looked almost human, but deathly pale. It had no hair on its head or anywhere else on its body that I could see. It had arms and legs that seemed human, but it crawled on the ground almost like a monkey. I couldn't see its eyes. They were just black circles against the pale face. The best way I can describe it is if a human skeleton had white skin stretched across it. That's what this thing looked like. We all watched it emerge from the forest. It saw us right away through the open window and it began approaching the trailer. I couldn't tell from the expression on its face if it was malicious or curious. One of my co-workers grabbed the flare gun from beneath the couch and took a shot at the creature and hit it dead in the chest. Whatever that thing was, it retreated back into the forest, and we didn't have any problems with it again, at least for the rest of that summer. I wish I could go back in time and ask my grandpa what it was. He knew about those things out there in the forest. He knew they would come if you called them. This all happened to me a few years ago when I was hiking a remote trail in the Colorado Rockies with my three German shepherds. I was carrying a relatively heavy pack filled with water and other supplies for Elvis, Luca, and Teddy, so I wasn't moving quickly enough to suit them. I knew that I was probably the only human around for miles, so I let the dogs off their leashes so they could explore. All three dogs are very well trained, and they always come back immediately when I call, so I really didn't think there would be any harm. A few miles in, I whistled for the dogs so we could take a water break. All three came from different locations, panting happily and glad to get a snack. It was a gorgeous day, and the rock I was sitting on was warm from the sun. The dogs curled up in the grass nearby, and even though I didn't mean to, I dozed off for a while. I couldn't have been asleep for more than 20 minutes, but when I woke up, there was absolute chaos. All three dogs were barking hysterically with lots of growls and yelps. I couldn't see them, but it sounded like they were close by. I scrambled off the trail toward the sound and I could hear a new noise now. It was a deep, low-pitched moan. I immediately thought that the dogs had cornered a bear. I ran back to my pack and I grabbed the leashes and the bear spray that was in the side pocket, and then I crashed back through the trees, yelling their names. I was getting closer. I kept pushing through branches and foliage, desperate to find them. Just after walking through a cloud of what smelled like the worst B.O. I had ever imagined, I finally saw all three dogs. And then I saw what they were barking at. There were two of them backed up against a giant boulder at the top of a short rise in the forest floor. Now I'm nearly six feet tall, but I could tell that they were much taller than that. They looked human, except for the fact that their naked bodies were covered head to toe in thick, black, coarse hair. They also looked terrified. I was scared out of my wits, but I almost felt bad for them. They were making calm-down motions toward the dogs with their hands and making low sounds that seemed soothing. Luca, the largest German shepherd, was nearly hysterical. His muzzle was flecked with foam, and he was dancing around trying to decide if he should go in closer. Elvis stopped barking and started sniffing the ground, still a good distance away from the cornered creatures, but definitely getting curious. 
Teddy dropped back to my side the second he saw me whining softly and trying to shove his muzzle into the hand that was clutching the bear spray. I did not feel threatened, nor did I think that the creatures meant us any harm. I crouched down and I set the bear spray on the ground and I started to mirror the calm down motions with my hands as I slowly stepped closer. I quickly approached the other two dogs, clipping their leashes onto their harnesses and pulling them away. I spoke softly and calmly, hoping they would feed off my energy and realize that we weren't in any danger. As I tried to quiet Luca, I kept glancing at the creatures to make sure they were in the same spot. They hadn't moved. Luca finally stopped barking but kept making low growls. I didn't want to turn my back on the creatures, so I walked backwards, guiding the two dogs back to where Teddy was standing. I attached his leash to his harness, and now all three dogs were under control, and I finally thought to myself, now what? The creatures seemed to be having a conversation. They weren't using words exactly, but their vocalizations had a rhythm, and they were gesturing towards us and waving their arms. They didn't seem upset, just curious, just like me. Now things were calming down, and I was able to understand the magnitude of the situation. I was face to face with Bigfoot, two of them. I had an incredible opportunity. I decided to try and engage with them, hoping that the dogs would cooperate. I found a tree that seemed sturdy enough, and I quickly unhooked each dog and looped the leashes around the trunk. They would be secure, but also unable to help me if anything went wrong. I decided to stay close. So I picked up the bear spray, and then I tried to make eye contact with the creatures. I locked eyes with the smaller one, and I smiled to show that I was friendly. It smiled back, and the taller one followed suit. Feeling brave, I motioned with a come-closer wave. They moaned to each other, and then came directly toward me. The smaller one came quickly and stretched its hand out towards the dogs. Even Elvis cooperated and let the creature stroke its ears. All three of them were sniffing, excitedly. The taller one approached me, also with its hand outstretched. Before I realized what was happening, it was trying to stroke my ears, and then it ran its hand over my short hair. They smelled terrible, but were incredibly gentle. Suddenly, both creatures seemed to respond to some sound that I couldn't hear. They craned their necks skyward, and after a few seconds, I heard the sounds of a helicopter nearby. After a final pat for Luca, Elvis, and Teddy, and me, both creatures hurried off into the thick trees. I stood for a few minutes, overcome by what had just happened, and then I untied my dogs, went and collected my pack, and headed back towards the trailhead. I looked over my shoulder the entire time. I didn't want to not consider that an encounter with a Bigfoot might not end so well. Northwestern Ohio, 2012. It was the summer of 2012, and I was camping with my twin brother Mike in the woods near Lake Erie, just west of Sandusky, Ohio. We did all the usual camping things like fishing, hiking, and canoeing. Basically, every day was full, and we went to bed early and woke up at dawn every day. One night, I had fallen asleep early, and I woke up at around three because I had to take a leak. I didn't feel like waking up my brother, even though mom and dad always made us promise to use the buddy system, even at our age. I thought that was stupid, so I didn't bother. Also, I basically didn't feel like it because I knew my brother would just whine and complain and I would spend more time trying to wake him up than it would take to just run to the bathroom and back. Anyway, the moon was almost full that night, so it gave off plenty of light for me to see everything outside the tent. Also. There weren't many bushes in the area around our site, so I didn't have to worry or be afraid of something hiding and waiting to sneak up on me. Watching too many scary movies can do that to you. As I was walking towards the bathroom, well, I should honestly say running because it was creepy out there alone, my heart suddenly skipped a beat when I saw something that scared the crap out of me. Not far from the path were two dog-like creatures just standing there staring at me. I blinked to be sure I was really seeing what I was seeing and not still asleep, and that's when they took a step towards me. I completely freaked out, and I started running back to the tent. 
all the while listening to what sounded like they were chasing after me and making the strangest noises. And the weird thing is that the noises weren't so much a dog or wolf sound, but more of something like a human. It was the scariest sound ever, and it gave me goosebumps. These creatures were gaining on me. At least that's what it felt like from the sound of it. But I was too afraid to turn around. I thought that at any second they would pounce on me and attack. But that never happened. But when I finally did make it back to the tent, my heart was beating so fast and loud that Mike woke up and asked what was going on. I told him what had just happened. He laughed, told me to shut up. Dude, I told him, if you don't believe me, go out there yourself and see. He laughed again and said, sure thing, I have to go anyway. So I sat there and I watched Mike stand up and head out of the tent. Even though he was totally irritating, I knew that this was serious. I couldn't let him go out there by himself. I followed him out of the tent and into the darkness. My eyes took a few seconds to adjust, but I could see him standing about 15 yards away, staring off at the trees. I walked over next to him and I looked in that direction too. Nothing seemed amiss on the surface except for the fact that we were staring into pitch black forest. But then as my eyes adjusted, I could see something in the shadows. It was a dog. No, it was part dog, part man. It didn't move or growl, it just stood there frozen. The dog part of it looked like any dog you would see in the neighborhood, but with yellow eyes and a dog-like head. The human part was just the upper half, like it stopped at its waist, other than the fact that it was standing there on two legs like a man. To say that I was scared at that moment would be an understatement. I whispered to Mike and asked what he thought it was. He said he didn't know, but we needed to get back to the tent ASAP. I was about to say okay when the creature let out this horrific howl. The sound of the thing echoing through the trees was like nothing I had ever heard before. I think Mike and I had our hearts in our throats because we just couldn't say a word. And we didn't even wait one second. We just ran back to the tent and threw the flap open. We were both terrified. Mike was shaking, and I felt like throwing up. I asked him what we should do now, and he said that he didn't know. But whatever we needed to do, it would have to be done fast. Because if this thing got in our tent, it would kill us for sure. At that same moment, we heard a dog howl in the distance, and we started to feel relieved until it was answered by another howl, closer to us, like right outside the tent. It had followed us. And there was another one that it was talking to, off in the distance. This thing wasn't wasting any time. Before we knew it, it had started digging under the tent flap. At first I thought this was impossible. Then all of a sudden there were claws on our tent floor. Mike and I were both screaming hysterically at this point, but then it stopped, and there was nothing but silence. We waited inside the tent, not being able to see anything, just waiting for some sort of noise that would tell us what was going on. I'd say about ten minutes passed without a sound, so we decided to risk it and peek outside the tent. The thing was nowhere to be found, but there were what looked like dog tracks everywhere around the tent, circling it and then leading off into the woods. We couldn't see the prints too far off in the darkness, but we could see far enough that we felt safe that the coast was clear to dash to the car, which was about a hundred yards away. It took us less than ten seconds to get there, it felt like, but when we looked back, we could see that we were now being chased. Three of them were now coming out of the woods, headed straight for us. They were just like the one we had seen at the campsite, but these looked to be about three times bigger, with darker fur. Mike flung open the car door as fast as he could, but when he turned back to me, I was gone. I had tripped over something, trying to get away. They were right on our heels, and they chased after us in a full-out sprint. I scrambled back up, and I got to the car just in time, with Mike screaming in my ears to hurry to get inside. Before opening the door, I looked back just in time to see one of them running at me with its canine teeth bared red eyes, and then the creature stopped on a dime, right in front of my face, with its breath reeking of death. But then, it just disappeared. I mean, I think it disappeared. 
Later, Mike would say that it had turned and ran off so quickly that it was almost like it vaporized. Mike was so intent on getting out of there that the car started moving before I was fully inside, and he almost drove off without me because I nearly fell out while trying to pull my door shut. We escaped the forest that night, but it still gives us nightmares to this day to think of what might have happened if we hadn't gotten back to that tent, but mostly back to the car. I don't know who or what those dog men are or where they came from, but I just want everybody who lives out in those woods to be aware that there are creatures there in northern Ohio, and you need to be careful. Now I've been researching ever since our incident, and I really believe that they came down from Michigan, since we're pretty close to the state line. I mean, I read that some people think they originated there or that there are large groups there. Either way, it's too close for comfort for me. I'm a game warden in western Pennsylvania. As an outdoorsman, it's a dream job. But that's not to say that it's without its drawbacks. For example, whether we are having summer heat or freezing winter temperatures, I'm expected to head into the woods to protect our land's natural resources. And of course, Dealing with armed and sometimes drunk hunters is a risk. Despite all of this, I love it, and I couldn't see myself ever doing anything else. Until a few months ago. Deer season in all of its various forms runs a few months out of the year, generally October through January and up till April in some cases, with the busiest season being November. But around here, Some people forget about deer season altogether, and they strike out into the woods during the summer. That's where I come in. It was this past August, and we had already sighted dozens of poachers in the county. Fortunately, none turned violent or had gotten out of hand. I was on good terms with a lot of the people who lived out in the hunting territories. Most of them had big properties with some type of water feature which drew the deer in. It was late afternoon when I got a call from one such person who told me he had seen a group of three men with rifles cutting across the back of his property line. I called it in, then headed over to the property. If it was the group I thought it was, they wouldn't give me too much trouble, so I knew I'd be fine to approach them on my own. That was a mistake. After a brief conversation with the property owner, I left my vehicle parked in his driveway and I headed out into the woods behind his home. On the way, I saw plenty of deer droppings and the trees were marked up from shedding bucks. I have to remember this spot for myself, I thought. I walked in following a game trail for about 30 minutes but found no sign of the illicit hunters. Now this was odd. There really wasn't any reason for them to have gone any deeper than this. And what's odder is that besides the signs, I hadn't seen a single deer. Right when I had decided to turn around and search in another direction, I came across the carcass of a dead buck. Its neck was broken. Its pale eyes were staring at a 180-degree angle from its chest. And its body was crushed into the ground. I reached down and I ran my hand along its rib cage, and I could feel that the ribs were shattered into pieces. Its hindquarters had been torn off, and they lay ten yards away. Bloody entrails were strewn across the ground like tree roots. Now, I'm not prone to panic, but this was bizarre. Poachers certainly hadn't done this, and I knew of no animal that could or would enact such violence. I snapped a couple of quick pictures with my phone, and then I started moving back down the trail. That's when I felt it. The ground began to tremble slightly, and I heard a series of heavy impacts behind me. Despite being stricken with fear, I turned to see what it was. And there, from the forest, came a massive creature at least ten feet high and half that wide across. Vines, leaves, branches, and twigs were wrapped around the creature completely, like it was a walking piece of the forest. It walked on a pair of thick, tree-stump-like legs, and its arms ended in a pair of dense foliage, roughly the size of a human head. I couldn't see or discern anything that resembled a face. I stood frozen. The creature was taking slow, meaningful steps, not going in any specific direction. 
Hoping I could get away quietly, I started backing slowly away, with my eyes locked on the creature. Bad idea. I pulled a stupid move and accidentally stepped onto a dead branch. The noise snapped out like a gunshot. The lumbering beast snapped in my direction, and after a brief pause, began storming towards me. I ran. I ran as hard as I ever had. In spite of its size, I could hear the creature keeping pace with me, crashing through the brush like a tank. I finally got a lead when the trail narrowed and the creature was so massive that it needed to force its way through. I cut around a curve in the trail, and it was momentarily out of sight. I then heard a thunderous crack, and looking up behind me, I saw a tree falling into the forest. Then I felt something grab me. It was a man, with a rifle, slung over his shoulder. He pulled on my arm and told me to follow him. I could hear the creature back out on the trail, once again crashing through the forest. I followed the man for a minute or two until he led me to an overturned tree that had created a deep depression in the ground. Two other men were already tucked in underneath. My savior and I joined them. The four of us packed tightly together. We sat for an hour, none of us saying anything, not a single word. We could hear the monster stomping through the forest, searching. Once it came close enough that we could see it. Two of the men readied their rifles for a last stand, but it walked away without incident. And then, at last, it grew quiet, and the four of us left the safety of the tree, and we ran. We ran all the way to the tree line without seeing the creature, and there we stopped to catch our breaths. It was obvious that these were the poachers I was with, but they had literally saved my life. As a group, we agreed to never speak of this incident for fear of ridicule. Wild allegations like this could cost me my job. And with that, the three of them headed off towards their truck, which they said was close by. I returned to the driveway, and fortunately the owner wasn't home. I was too shaken up to have a normal conversation with him anyway. I called in and I said I didn't find the poachers and that I would be cutting my shift a few hours early. I'm still a warden, and I still go into that forest every day, but it's not the same. I don't feel a sense of calm or peace anymore, and I'm constantly on edge, dreading that I'll encounter this thing again. If you have any suggestions for how I can move on, please let me know. I'm a police officer in Suffolk County, Long Island, New York. For those of you who don't know, the majority of Long Island is densely populated. It thins out a little more the further east you go, but for the most part, it's shoulder to shoulder up and down the island. That's not to say it's an urban hell. We have a multitude of parks, coastlines, and recreational areas that balance out the tightly packed townships. And it's in one of those nice little parks that this story takes place. Kanetquat State Park in Oakdale. 3,400 acres of protected woodland and water. It's one of the premier trout fishing locations on the island, and there's a fee just to even get through the gate. Most incidents are handled by the state park agencies, but from time to time, we have a need to enter the park. And that's what happened the other night. An abandoned car was called in along the side of the road on Sunrise Highway. Apparently, it had been sitting there for several hours, and the county has a strict tow policy for abandoned vehicles. I just had to go and get some info from the plates and wait for the tow truck. But when I got there, I noticed something odd. The passenger door was halfway open, not something you would have seen from the road. There was a splatter of crimson on the ground next to the door. It looked like blood. The blood wound away from the car in a trail and right up to the park's fence line. Right where the blood trail terminated, a huge gash had been ripped open in the chain-link fence, and bits of torn clothing was caught on parts of the fence. I called in the anomaly, but backup would be delayed because of a violent incident that had happened a little way down the road. So I did something foolish, and I decided to investigate on my own. I still didn't know exactly what I was heading into, so I moved as quietly as possible through the park's forest. I knew the river curved close to this portion of the road, and I hoped that whomever I was looking for hadn't crossed over, or worse. After just a few minutes of movement, I could start to make out the noise of running water. 
and I knew that the river was only a few hundred yards away. And then I heard a branch snap behind me. I turned quickly, and I came face to face with a sight that nearly saw me vomit on the spot. A man stood before me in torn and bloodied clothing. The bottom half of his jaw was missing, as if completely torn away. His single remaining eye stared wildly at me. I rushed over to him and caught him just as he collapsed to the ground. I had basic medical response training, but this was well out of what I was capable of tending to. A dozen cuts ran through the length of his torso, and a chunk of flesh was missing from his right arm. It was amazing that he was still alive, let alone walking around. The options racing through my mind were cut short by a bizarre noise coming from the river at my rear. Some kind of inhuman chittering and chattering, like the high-pitched voices of children. Hearing the sound, the man began to tremble uncontrollably, and I lost my grip on him. I wheeled around toward the river to see what was next in this nightmare sequence of events. From the banks rose two tall figures nearly half again the size of a normal man. Their faces were set back in deep black hoods so as not to be seen except for the two dots of sickly yellow that were fixated on me. Each of their left hands appeared to be human, but their right hands extended into foot-long, sickle-like blades. Their inane chattering grew louder as they walked towards me, and a sick fear erupted in my stomach. I pulled my firearm from my holster without the presence of mind to command them to stop, and I fired. The shots passed through them, except for the last one, which burst straight through one of the sickly eyes. The creature let out a wild scream, pulling its human hand to its face while lashing out wildly with its bladed arm. I fired at the other creature, just as it burst into motion, coming towards me. Two shots, and then a click. I turned and ran. The horror behind me made me run haphazardly through the dark forest, and I hoped that I was heading back in the direction that I had come. I could hear the creature beating the ground behind me, emitting its high-pitched screech. The pursuit lasted several minutes until ahead of me I saw a blue and red strobe light. The road was close by. There were officers there. I ran all the harder, and I nearly slammed into the chain-link fence. I glanced back over my shoulder quickly, and I couldn't see the thing anywhere so I grabbed onto the fence and I nearly threw myself over the top. The officer must have seen me jumping over because he wheeled his car around on the road and ran up onto the shoulder just beside me. It was a man I knew, and once he saw me, he called for paramedics and backup. I'll cut out the follow-up. Long story short, neither the man's body nor either of the creatures was ever recovered or ever seen. The vehicle was still there in the bloody trail but not even canine units could locate anything outside of that. I've been remanded to an intense psychiatric evaluation and placed on paid administrative leave. I've been told that the stress of the job has just caught up to me and that some time off would be good for my mental health. But that's just their polite way of saying I'm batshit crazy and I shouldn't be carrying a weapon. But I know I'm not crazy. I know that those two things or whatever they were are still out there. And maybe there are more. I should have known something was wrong from the smell. It was rancid, like death a thousand times over. If you've ever smelled a dead body, amplify it times a thousand and you'll get an idea. I was ice fishing on a lake in rural Wisconsin, tucked away in my little heated ice shack, It had been a relatively uneventful morning, not much activity below the ice. Around noon, I broke into my lunchbox and I pulled out a sandwich, but before I could take a bite, I was hit with that awful smell. I searched the contents of my lunch, but everything in there looked just fine. The interior of the ice shack did smell a bit like fish, I'll admit, but it wasn't anything like that. This smell just showed up suddenly and completely without explanation. It was so strong. I was doing everything I could to keep from gagging. It took me a moment to realize the source of the smell was actually coming from outside the shack. I bolted for the door to get some fresh air, only to realize that the situation was worse out there. 
I saw a couple of other people standing outside their ice houses too, probably experiencing the same phenomenon I was. I yelled across the lake, asking them if they too were out there because of the smell. One of the people pointed at something in the distance. I immediately turned around to look and was in total shock at what I saw. It was an elk, pure white, and completely emaciated. Even from that distance, I could almost count its rib bones. Its fur was as white as the snow, but long and stringy, similar to that of a wet dog. I could see large swaths of red under its neck and across its side. I assumed it was blood from an injury, and it looked like a pretty bad injury, too. Despite what looked like heavy bleeding, the elk walked across the ice without hesitation, without problems. Its legs were long and spindly, but I didn't think that was atypical for an elk. To be honest, I had never seen an elk before, not in person like this. They're extremely rare in this area. We all stood outside our shacks, staring at this elk that appeared to be walking right towards us. As the elk approached, the stench got even stronger. And it was hard to imagine that smell could be coming from something living. But as the elk came into clearer view, I finally understood why. This was no normal living creature, at least not in the way that we know animals to be. It was clearly alive somehow, but there was more to it. Its whole body was rotten. As it got closer, I could see pieces of its flesh exposed and just hanging from its bones. It was the most disturbing thing I had ever seen in my life. The red in its fur appeared to be a mix of old and new blood. There were areas that were clearly clotted and matted into the hair, while the wounds continued to drip bright red. And if you thought that was bad, it gets worse. The elk's head, well, it didn't have any skin on it. It took me a moment to realize what I was looking at since the creature had white fur, but its head, it looked like the skin of its face had been peeled back and was hanging down around its neck. The hide there was dried up but still had the fur on it. All the muscles had been peeled away too, leaving just the skull and antlers. I couldn't see its eyes, just two empty black sockets. Same for its nose. This thing looked like a walking corpse, and it smelled like one too. But here was the thing, walking straight towards us like it didn't have a care in the world. And then, all of a sudden, it fell through the ice. I don't know how or why. The ice was at least 12 inches thick. There were trucks parked out there. There was no way that thing weighed enough to break through the ice, but it did, and it didn't resurface. As soon as the beast fell into the water, the smell disappeared. I went over to talk to the other fishermen, and they were just as dumbfounded as I was. We all ended up contacting the closest DNR office about the whole ordeal. I felt like a crazy person explaining this story to them, and I wasn't sure if they even believed me. When I went back the following day to retrieve my ice shack, there was yellow caution tape up around the boat launch. I'd say there were at least seven, maybe eight, DNR vehicles there. They let me get my shack off the ice, but they said the lake would be closed to the public for the rest of the season. They wouldn't say why, but I knew it had something to do with that elk that fell through the ice. It bothered me for some time, quite some time. I knew there was something more to the story. The DNR knew something, but they weren't about to give out the information. The lake remained closed into the summer, and that's when I heard a rumor from someone who lived near the lake. I didn't hear the story firsthand, so I can't say what did or did not happen beyond what I saw myself. But the rumor was that the DNR dredged the lake when the ice melted in the spring, and they found the body of that big old elk. They hooked onto its antlers and pulled it up to shore. There's a truck and a trailer there waiting for it, but before they could load the elk's body onto the trailer, it disappeared. Like it got up and it walked away after being trapped under the ice for months. Like I said, I can't confirm the end of the story, but none of it surprises me. That thing looked dead when I saw it walking out on the ice. I'm sure it looked dead enough when they pulled it up from the lake bed, but it wasn't. I certainly hope to never see anything like that again but I'm almost positive it's out there, 
somewhere in the Wisconsin woods. I never thought I would be saying this, but I'm now a believer in the supernatural. I was always a skeptic, but I recently saw something that definitely wasn't from the natural world. I'm a rock hound. I dig for crystals like amethyst and smoky quartz in my free time. I've made some pretty cool finds, too. One was a 15-inch green barrel piece that I sold for 200 bucks, and a few small clusters of ruby, which I've kept for my collection. I live near the White Mountains of New Hampshire, and I had been working on a mountainside littered with feldspar that seemed promising. A storm had uprooted some trees in the area, and I'd found signs of quartz when I dug into one of the pits left behind by the root ball. And when a tree uproots, you've got a lot of the hard work done already. There's not so much to dig. I had dug a pretty good-sized pit over the course of three weeks, just on my days off. And now it was between six and seven feet deep, with the sides shored up. Once it got to be near the five-foot mark, I'd brought a small stepladder with me to leave at the site. Using the stepladder at the bottom of the hole, combined with my usual rope looped around a nearby tree, I could navigate in and out without any trouble. On this particular day, I was going at it, making real progress. I got pretty excited when I found a large chunk of smoky quartz with amethyst tips. I was tempted to stop and wash it off, but I was in my groove, so I just kept digging. Besides, I knew I was going to have to stop in about an hour to dump the buckets of dirt that I had almost filled. I usually don't tell people where I'm digging. I don't want to do all this work and then have somebody come in the minute I leave and find the prize. That's happened to me before, and it really sucked. But this time I told my friend Jeff, because he's just getting started with gem hunting, and I trust him. So I gave Jeff pretty good directions, being that you have to park about a half a mile away on a logging road. So when I heard somebody walking by, you know, twigs snapping and stuff, I was pretty sure it was Jeff. I just kept on working, knowing Jeff would see my backpack and the red flags on posts marking the pit, which I did that as a precaution against someone, or me, stumbling in and breaking a leg. The footsteps came nearer and stopped pretty close by. So I quit digging and I looked up, said, Jeff, is that you? Fully expecting to see his face peering down at me. But there was no response, nothing but sky. And then a hail of small rocks, like big pebbles, came sailing in, and a few bounced off my shoulder and my back. They didn't hurt, but still I was like, what the hell? I turned around and I put one foot on the stepladder, intending to come up to let him know what you don't do when somebody's in the pit. I had just started to rise up, still on the bottom rung, when a shower of dirt came raining down on me, right in my face. Well, now I was pissed. I bent my head, trying to shake the dirt off, wiping my face and blinking my eyes. And that's when the light above me changed. I squinted to look up. There was this thing looking down at me. It was as big as a man, but it was not human. The head looked like the head of an iguana, except that it had this flat face without a snout. Just slits for a nose. Definitely reptile-looking, green and scaly, and staring right at me. I swear it was as big as me, if not bigger. Even with my eyes streaming tears from all the crap in them, I could see shoulders and a neck. Like the thing was bent over, but standing on two feet, not lying on its belly. And it had these huge gold eyes with black slits for pupils, kind of like a snake. I was so shocked that I fell backwards right at the bottom of the pit, whacking my shoulder on one of the buckets. Lying there, I felt absolutely terrified and trapped, like a bug under glass. This thing was looking at me like I was a meal, and you can't imagine what that felt like. To have nowhere to run, just stuck there in the hole. It moved away, disappearing so I couldn't see it anymore, and that's when I got my wits about me. I immediately got into a crouch and I grabbed my shovel, holding it like a weapon. I didn't know what I was going to do, but one thing I knew, I wasn't going without a fight. I waited, still trying to process what I had seen, and a minute later I heard this sound like something being dragged across the dirt. I was tempted to try to climb up out of the pit and make a run for it, but I'm ashamed to say that I was too scared. I was just like that cliche you hear, 
paralyzed with fear. And then all of a sudden, the tips of branches came into view, moving over the top of the hole. Pine branches with half-dead needles on them that the whatever it was must have dragged over. The branches slowly started blocking out the light. The thing seemed to be laying the branches over the top of the pit, causing a little shower of dirt and debris to come falling in on me. It might sound weird, but when this happened, it gave me hope. I started thinking that maybe I might get out of this after all. My worst fear was getting buried alive. My second worst fear was getting eaten, right there on the spot. So what it was doing now, yeah, it gave me some hope. I think it might have been covering me up to save me for later. I really don't know. So I just waited, getting sort of claustrophobic as the light was now about 80% blocked. I just stayed quiet, and I listened. After a while, I thought I heard it leave, some twigs snapping in the forest nearby. I knew I wouldn't have any trouble pushing the limbs out of the way, and I still had my stepladder and my rope, so I wasn't trapped, but I was still afraid. So what if it was still out there? Could I defend myself with just a shovel? I hadn't seen its whole body, but it looked as big as me. I decided to wait, just a few minutes longer, so I just sat there replaying my favorite songs in my head, trying to calm myself down. Then, after about maybe five minutes, I heard movement, movement coming from nearby, and my stomach clenched up again, thinking I had waited too long, and now the thing was coming back to eat me. I gripped my shovel, and I waited, watching the branches overhead, and then I heard my name being called. It was Jeff. Thank God. I shouted back that I was in the pit covered with branches near the red flags. I yelled, don't fall in, because that's the last thing we needed. A minute later, Jeff was pulling branches out of the way and looking down at me, completely confused. How in the world did you do that? He asked. He helped me out, and I went right over to my backpack and got a drink of water. My hands were shaking. I told him there was something in the woods. We needed to leave, right away. I said I would tell him about it after we got to our vehicles. I was not going to stand there and have the thing come back while we were talking. Then I just turned, and I left. Jeff followed me, asking questions the whole way, but I waited until I saw my truck before I said too much. I was so relieved to get in the vehicle. I think adrenaline had kept me going that whole time. And once I got somewhere safe, all the energy just went right out of me. I told Jeff what happened, and while he didn't think I was making it up, he didn't believe it was a monster. He thought my vision got messed up from the dirt and that it was just some jerk who covered the pit with branches messing with me. He even suggested that it was a human wearing a mask. But who would be out in the middle of nowhere wearing a mask? I know what I saw, and I'm never going back there again, not even to collect my gear. I count myself lucky to be alive. This encounter takes place just north of Las Vegas, Nevada, in Echo Canyon State Park. The four people involved all live in Henderson, which is a suburb of Las Vegas. The four people include Jessica and three of her friends who had all been planning a camping trip for weeks. The plan was to head up north to Echo Canyon State Park and spend a few nights away. They were all excited to spend time in nature, away from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. Jessica was busy. She worked long hours at her job at the Hawthorne Suites Hotel often working the night shift and being so tired in the day that she didn't have much time for anything else. When she did have free time, she liked to spend it with her friends and family and being outdoors such as this. So she was especially looking forward to the trip. She had read about Echo Canyon but had never been before, and it seemed like a perfect spot. But now, as they were getting closer and closer to the destination, Jessica started to have this weird sense of unease. She wasn't sure why, but something about it just didn't seem right. It was definitely a strange reaction. Echo Canyon is a beautiful place. The canyon walls tower above you and the river is crystal clear. There are plenty of places to explore and the group had plans to spend hours hiking and swimming. They were even hoping to find the hidden waterfall that one of them had read about. But as soon as they arrived at the campsite, Jessica's unease turned into outright fear. 
There was something about the place that just felt off to her. She couldn't explain it, and she knew it was going to be hard for her to stay there. The group began to set up camp, but Jessica just couldn't shake the feeling. She tried to push it out of her mind, but she couldn't help but feel they were being watched. And then that night, Jessica's fear only grew. She could see the shadows lengthening and stretching across the campground, and she felt like something was stalking them. She knew she was being ridiculous, but she couldn't help it. She was sure that something was out there waiting to attack them. She then asks her friends if they all want to go back to the tents. She figured that if she could just get to sleep, maybe she could wake up in the morning and everything would be over. But everyone else was talking and having a good time, and they weren't ready to end the night just yet. The other truth is that Jessica was deathly afraid of the dark. She hadn't told her friends this, but ever since she was a child, she had been terrified of the night. She even sometimes had nightmares about creatures coming to get her in the darkness. Even still, she decided to brave the darkness and go to her tent by herself. For whatever reason, the mindless chatter wasn't her thing. At first, all seemed okay as she was walking back to the tent, but before long, she was convinced that she saw something moving in the darkness. She squinted, but couldn't quite make out what it was, and she wasn't even sure if it was anything. Maybe just shadows playing with her mind. The movement and the shadows moved closer, but still nothing that she could make out. And then after stopping and squinting into the trees a few times, a creature revealed itself breaking out of the shadows right in front of her. And now she can see that this creature is unlike anything she has ever seen before. It's standing on two legs, and it is taller than her. It has a long body with fur all over it. She's terrified. She can't even get her mind to think or her mouth to yell for her friends. She said it looked like a cross between a human and an animal, covered in fur eyes glowing red, and it had long, sharp claws hanging down at its sides. And then the creature opened its mouth, and Jessica could see that it had long, sharp teeth. All of it was too much. She panicked, but at the same time was unable to react at all due to her fear. So she stood there. The creature purposely was moving closer to her. And not before long, she could feel its hot breath on her skin. She tries to scream, but she can't. So without thinking, she tries to run back to her friends, but trips and falls to the ground. And now the creature is standing over her with its claws up and curled, ready to strike. Jessica knows for sure. She feels she's about to die. And then suddenly she hears a voice. The creature hears it too and stops moving towards her. The noise breaks the silence again and the creature runs off into the darkness. Jessica doesn't know what to do, how to react. So she stays where she is, lying on the ground, scared and holding her head in her hands. Within seconds, she hears footsteps coming towards her, and she hopes that it's her friends. But she's too scared to lift her head and focus in the direction of the footsteps. Instead, she just cowers into herself even more, her head down, sobbing. And then she feels someone touching her, and she slowly opens her eyes to see her friend Sarah standing over her. Sarah is saying something, but Jessica can barely make it out. All she can do is watch Sarah's mouth moving. Sarah helps Jessica get herself up and leads her back to the campsite. Jessica is shaken mentally and her body won't stop shivering. But otherwise, she's unharmed and has no physical damage. Sarah ultimately mustered the strength to describe the creature to her friends, saying that it was like a cross between a human and an animal telling them it was taller than anybody she knew and covered in fur, with the red eyes and the sharp claws and teeth. She knew the story seemed absurd as she said the words out loud, but the look on her face had her friends horrified, and so they unanimously decided to pack everything up and leave. Even though it was basically the middle of the night, nobody wanted to stay any longer. They were all freaked out. Nobody wanted to be in the dark alone. And so they leave, quickly packing up their things and getting everything into the car. They don't even bother packing up in an organized fashion. They just throw the gear and the tents into the car and take off. They drive all the way home without much discussion, wanting to put as much distance between them and the creature as possible. 
while they all think about what happened. In the end, none of them ever goes back to Echo Canyon State Park again. They're all too scared of what or who they might see. I was driving late one night through North Dakota on I-94. If you've never been, most of North Dakota is flat and seems endless when you're driving. I was visiting family in Minnesota, and this always proved to be the quickest route. Maybe it wasn't the best decision driving through the night, but I was already a day late, and I figured maybe the drive would go quicker after dark. I turned out to be very, very wrong. It started with the radio. It would short out periodically here and there. I usually had pretty good reception in the Dakotas due to there being absolutely zero interference because everything is so flat. But my radio kept going static. It was just an annoyance at first, but the next thing that started happening was that the volume would go up and then down by itself. I figured it was my radio going bad. I was driving an older sedan and I was pretty sure the radio was original. After fussing with it for a few minutes, I just turned it off and continued my drive in silence. I will admit it was more than a little creepy driving through there at night without the radio to drown out my thoughts. Just as I was beginning to settle into my silent drive, the radio came on by itself. Now my car is older, so I don't have any radio controls on the wheel, so I know I didn't accidentally touch the radio. It literally came on all by itself. It was just static, no signal. I turned it off again and kept driving. This happened three more times. The radio turned on by itself. I had enough, and I pulled over on the side of the freeway. I dug the radio out of its spot with a pocket knife, and I disconnected the entire thing. It took me about 30 minutes, but I was sick of its antics. I still had a long drive ahead of me, and I didn't want to deal with that thing turning on and off at will. So I was just about to pull back onto the freeway when I heard static coming from the radio. But this time, the radio was sitting on the passenger seat, wires disconnected. And somehow, it was still on. I rolled down the window of the car. I chucked the radio out. And that's when I saw them. There were about two dozen lights floating out in the field next to my car. They were all sort of a bluish-white color maybe more white than blue. At first they looked randomly spaced, but then it sort of also looked like they had an organization to them. It was the strangest scene I had ever seen in my life. I have no idea why, but I got out of the car to get a better look. I just felt drawn to them somehow. I walked past the radio on the ground, still spewing the static despite being completely unplugged from any power source. That alone should have tipped me off to get the hell out of there, but I didn't even think of it. The only thing I thought about were those lights. They were far away from me at first, maybe a hundred yards. They looked to be about baseball-sized. They were all floating maybe three feet off the ground. It was too dark to get a good look at the landscape. I could see a few of the lights reflect off of a body of water that I assumed was maybe a lake or a pond. I couldn't see any trees, just open land. The lights were all moving when I saw them from the car, like giant lightning bugs. But then when I stepped outside, they all stopped, almost like they had noticed me. I can't say much of anything was going through my head at the time. I don't know why I got out of the car or why I approached the lights. I had no idea what they even were. The lights all froze in that field, still floating above the ground. And then all of a sudden, they all dropped simultaneously. They were still glowing, but now they were all just on the ground. And then they began to move towards one another. I just stood there, staring. I had no idea what I was staring at, but I couldn't look away. The lights all assembled themselves into a line then, and then came right at me, like a snake slithering through the grass. I snapped out of my trance. I knew right away something was very wrong. I knew I had to get back into my car before those things reached me. The lights were moving fast, but I wasn't too far from my car, and I'd left the door wide open. I can't tell you how fast I put the car in drive and peeled out onto the freeway. I don't know what would have happened if they had caught up to me, but I knew it wasn't going to be good. I watched them in my rearview mirror as I picked up speed. 
They were all hovering around the area where my car was, like they were looking at something. And then I remembered the radio. I can't explain the situation with the radio or what those lights had to do with it, but I'm certain that they were connected. I don't know if they made my radio malfunction in an attempt to make me stop on the side of the road or what. Maybe it was coincidental. Maybe I wasn't supposed to see them. I really have no idea, and I never figured out what they were despite searching everywhere for answers. I can say one thing for certain, though. I will never make a night drive again in a desolate area like that. About ten years ago, I was a Marine reservist. I had always wanted to contribute, to be in the service in some way, but I didn't want to be a full-time, active-duty Marine. Reservists go through the same type of training, but it's very much a part-time role. I had to commit to serving one weekend a month plus two weeks a year. But my lifestyle was flexible, and I got to live in my own home and act like a civilian most of the time. Of course, I could be mobilized to active duty if there was ever a national emergency or something like that. I'm not sure how amphibious training is done now but there was this one weekend where we had to participate in an amphibious landing exercise, and we took an excursion out to a lake in northern Georgia. We were going to be doing some amphibious assault stuff and a training patrol. It was the only time I ever remember doing this type of thing somewhere other than on a military installation. This time we were using a public lake. It seemed strange to me, and I didn't know how that decision was made, but apparently the local police and residents had been informed, so we supposedly wouldn't be freaking anybody out. This was taking place at around midnight. We arrived at the lake and got loaded up on our Zodiacs, which are inflatable boats. We rode for about 30 minutes and then stopped and slipped into the water. We swam to our designated spot and stashed our swim gear. Then we outfitted ourselves in our armored vests and other patrolling gear, By then, it was about 0100 hours. We started patrolling toward the objective and realized that we were within sight of some houses off in the distance. We couldn't see the houses clearly, but we could see light coming off of them, over the hill. We were pretty far away, but it was pretty wild to think what a sight we would be if anybody saw us. A six-man team with our rucksacks and all of our gear tramping through the woods. It might be hard to imagine a public lake as being a suitable training spot, but I'm telling you, it was rough going. There were vines growing everywhere, and we kept getting tripped up. We were trying to be quiet, too, but it's challenging to be groping around in the dark when you're carrying a big sniper rifle. I remember the guy in front of me had a training rocket across the top of his rucksack. For some reason, I kept expecting it to fall on the ground in front of me. It felt surreal out there. There wasn't much moonlight, and the terrain was treacherous. The vines were relentless, and we were making way more noise than we wanted to. We kept going until we were in an isolated tract of woods. We must have been at least a mile from any house or road at that point. We had reached the place where we were going to build our hide site. A hide site is built from whatever you can use in your surroundings. A well-built hide site can provide an incredible place for concealment. Once we got it done to our satisfaction, we settled in. I was sitting up against my rucksack, planning to try to get a little sleep. I was dozing off when I thought I heard feet shuffling through the leaves. I immediately snapped completely awake. Everyone else heard it, too. The sound was coming from behind us. I heard this weird flapping noise, and I had the sense that something had blown up into the black walnut tree, about twenty feet away but that flapping sound was substantial. It wasn't like any ordinary bird or anything. And then before we knew it, our hide site was being pelted with black walnuts. What would be doing this? Who would do such a thing? I mean, we all assumed it had to be some kind of bizarre animal. Everyone started quietly gathering their stuff up in case we had to move away. The team leader cautiously stuck his head out and shone his flashlight toward the tree. When we heard him gasp, we all froze. I had to see what it was, and when I looked, I couldn't believe it. It was a winged creature, but it had a human body, and it was standing in the tree like some kind of demon. My first thought was that it was somebody dressed in a costume. 
The black wings were huge, like the whole length of its body, and it wasn't anywhere close to Halloween yet. My mind was going through all of these contortions, just trying to figure it all out. And then the thing made this weird, high-pitched sound, and it glared at us with its red eyes. I swore it had to be a costume because that sort of thing doesn't exist. This all happened in just a few seconds. I raised my rifle, and I was about to order it to drop to the ground. And then it shrieked, and it flew backwards out of the tree into the dark behind it at like 60 miles an hour. My jaw just dropped. All of us were stunned. Nothing human could move like that. It was like it was wearing a jetpack or something, but it was completely silent at the same time. Honestly, none of us knew how to react to that. None of our hours of training had ever included a vision like that. It seemed supernatural. I'm pretty sure no one rested at all that night. We completed our mission, but we did not really have a feeling of accomplishment. We felt a huge sense of discomfort. We realized how impossible it was to truly be prepared for everything. This incident happened nearly five years ago, but it still shakes me to my core. My family and I frequented a lake house that we owned a few towns away. We planned our stay, hoping it would be a sunny weekend, but it ended up that a storm rolled in on the day that this happened. I left for the lake house first, figuring I'd set up ahead of everybody. Plus, I wanted dibs on the back bedroom. It had beautiful dark cherry wood French doors that opened up into the back patio. I cleaned up and settled in, and by this time, late afternoon was fast approaching. The dark clouds were starting to roll in, and along with those, a cool breeze. With no hesitation, I went out to the back storage house to grab some fresh cut wood that we had stored out there. I flipped on the light switch and proceeded to grab a few logs to put in the wheelbarrow, and just before I set the pieces of wood in, the light bulb started swaying with the wind and flashed over the bottom of the wheelbarrow. Upon further examination, it looked like a dark reddish-black gunk on the bottom. I didn't give it much thought at that point, and I continued loading the wood. As I rolled the wheelbarrow to the front door, I made it just in time as the rain began to pour. Once I had the fireplace going, I didn't mind. The taps of rain on the window and the warmth crackling from the fire nearly put me to sleep. In fact, I would have fallen asleep too if my phone hadn't rang. It was the rest of the family, calling to tell me that they were stuck behind a tree that had fallen during the storm. I told them it was fine. I didn't mind being there alone for a bit. I was enjoying my own company. With the storm, the trees and branches swaying outside started to sound more and more extreme. I could hear branches tapping against the window, but still I was unbothered. I thought of it as soothing chaos. In order to pass some time, I flipped the television on, and I turned to the news channel. I could see the county was already being plagued by rolling blackouts, and I figured that our area might be next. Wanting to be prepared, I searched around each room for some spare candles. It didn't take much time before I had a little collection of candles ready, just in case. And then a light bulb went off in my head. I remembered that the portable backup generator we had was in my room. I made my way down the hall, and I felt a strong wind coming, and I could see movement from the light coming out from under the door. I burst into the room, and I saw that the French doors were wide open. I rushed over, and I closed them, locked them, thinking the strong wind must have opened them. As soon as I closed those doors, I heard a knock at the front door. That couldn't be the family, I thought. They're still stuck in traffic, and nobody ever comes out here other than us. I reached for a baseball bat in the closet before slowly making my way towards the front door. I stepped up to the door, and I glanced through the peephole, and I saw an officer. Well, this was better than what I was thinking, and so I sat the bat down and I opened the door. Hello, ma'am. I was passing through, and I wanted to warn you that the roads leading to town are closed. I told him I was aware of the situation, and I was perfectly fine. He nodded and looked past me like he was looking to see if anybody else was in the house. I felt bad. I reluctantly asked if he'd like to step inside. After all, he was drenched from the rain, and he seemed out of breath. He came in, and he removed his hat and set it in the kitchen. I noticed he had a standard police hat, but the rest of his outfit seemed like a casual outfit. 
I wasn't a fool and I wanted to be safe, so I asked to see his badge. He said, of course, you can't be too careful. And he reached into his back pocket and flashed the badge. I could tell he felt the need to explain further and he went on to tell me that it was his day off, but given the situation, he was called in. So now my mind was more at ease and I offered him some coffee, told him he could warm up by the fire if he would like. But oddly enough, he sat a safe distance from it and he claimed that he was warm enough in the house. We talked for about an hour and I made my way to the kitchen to put the mugs in the sink. The window in front of the sink overlooked the road and I didn't see a cop car. Things then started to go off in my mind, but maybe I was overthinking. So then I returned to the living room where I had left him, and he was gone. I cautiously walked around the house calling for him. He wasn't in the bathroom. So this was when I really started to worry. As I made my way around, I heard commotion coming from the back storage house. I peeked through a window, and I could see that the door to it was wide open. Immediately, I grabbed the bat again, and I don't know what came over me, but I had zero fear as I rushed out to the back storage house. Rain was pouring down and trees were swaying. Still, I trucked myself out there, fast. The closer I got, a foul smell plagued the air. Just as I was about to step inside, I went to scream, but no sound came out of my mouth. I was frozen from what I was witnessing. There he was, with his back towards me, hunched over, squelching and chewing. Red liquid dripped to his feet. I backed up against the side of the door, and he paused, and he slowly turned to face me. His mouth was covered in blood, and a grimace of a smile took over his face. I remembered his teeth, sharp, long. And then he opened his mouth and said, I was hungry, and you were good company. My eyes pulled away from his mouth for a second, and that's when I noticed the lifeless rabbit in his grasp. All I could do was fall against the door, and that's the last thing I remembered. The next thing I knew, I was waking abruptly to find myself on the floor of the back storage house. I shot up, and there, next to me, were the remains of the rabbit. Could it be that I was just spared by a vampire? Was it because I was good company? I wish I had some answers. I was out for my morning walk on a crisp April morning when I saw something strange in the distance. I instantly knew something wasn't right because I walked this path almost every day and I knew it intimately. I squinted to bring it into better focus and I could sort of see that it looked like a large, hairy creature. But that didn't make sense. I wasn't sure what it was, but I also didn't want to get closer to find out, so I hid behind a tree, and I just watched it. The creature was definitely big and definitely hairy. It was also insane-looking. I would say it almost had this mean look on its face, but it didn't seem to be doing anything harmful. It just stood there, looking around. I remember thinking that it was acting curious, even though its face was horrid and that I wasn't sure how to read into anything from just the way it looked. And then the creature started sniffing around, like it was trying to catch the scent of something. And after a few quick minutes, it turned its head in my direction, and it looked directly towards me. I pulled myself in tight, and I stood as straight as I could behind the tree, hoping to throw it off, hoping it wouldn't see me. But I next heard footsteps on the ground basically twigs breaking and leaves moving about. I could also feel the heaviness of the creature as its legs hit the ground with each step. It was walking over to me. I was terrified. But then I heard it make a noise that sounded like a cross between a grunt and a moan. The noise wasn't exactly scary, but it was so confusing that the hair stood up on my arms. Even still, I didn't want to lean outside of the protection of the tree to look and see. So it just remained there, stick still and upright as much as possible. Next, I could feel the air turn warmer, and I heard the sounds of a low and slow, heavy breathing, raspy breathing. I could tell that the creature was very close to me now, and now I couldn't stop myself. I needed to see what I was up against. I slowly leaned sideways to try and look around the tree without exposing much of my body. And there, 
Only ten feet on the other side of the tree was this thing, animal-like, but man-like, and we looked at each other for what felt like forever. Its face is still seared in my memory, and I will never forget looking into its eyes. And then it blinked, and it shook its head, and it turned around and walked away. I watched it go until it completely disappeared into the woods. I was dumbfounded. Maybe it was just curious, and it didn't find me to be anything to worry about. I stood there thinking about that, wondering what it meant, when I heard another noise. This time it was a weird, guttural noise, different than the grunting and the moaning I had just heard earlier. This noise sent an extra shiver down my spine, and just as I was thinking about it, the same animal came heading back towards me, lumbering directly towards where I was standing. The creature slowly approached, and now I was terrified because it was coming back. Did it change its mind about me? Was it now thinking I was a threat, but I didn't want to run away and spark it to chase me? I didn't know what to do. As the creature got closer, I could see its eyes again. The eyes that seemed to reflect a brain that could think and communicate. And it still looked curious, not angry or mad. So I stood there, and I waited to see what it would do. It came close, like within a few feet, and it sniffed around at me with its big snout, and then it made the same weird noise again, and I almost wondered if it was trying to speak to me. After a few minutes of listening to it make these noises, but not reacting in any way, the creature seemed to get tired of me. It turned its head away, as if looking off into the distance for something. And then it turned around and it walked in the direction that it was looking. This time, it was gone for good. I never saw it again. But I'll never forget those strange noises that it made. And even more so, I'll never stop thinking about what it might have been trying to say to me. I am convinced that it came back to communicate, but that I wasn't able to understand. Either way, it's all something that will stay with me for the rest of my life. And now, every time I hear a strange noise in the woods, I always wonder if it's the creature coming back, wanting to try to communicate again. To be honest, I really wish I had been able to understand it. I even have dreams where we're able to understand each other, and all it wanted to do was to learn why we are so scared of it. This story comes to us from Karen a 56-year-old woman living about 45 minutes northwest of Atlanta, Georgia, in Cartersville. The encounter occurred the night of Wednesday, May 15, 2009, when she was on her way home from work from the job that she'd been working for over 30 years. That day, she had put in a long day and ended up staying a bit later than usual to catch up on some paperwork. She hadn't wanted to do it, but the administration was coming down hard on her so she just bit the bullet and stayed that day until it was finished. Now she was very much looking forward to getting home to her husband and dog, putting her feet up and hoping to avoid the headache that she could feel was coming on. About ten minutes into her drive home along Center Road, she was finally east of Route 75 and driving the final stretch to her house. However, at this point, she couldn't help but think about how this last bit of the drive always made her nervous. It was notorious with the neighbors for being a spot where animals roamed and wandered into the road. She had even hit a deer there herself a few years back, and she could name off at least six other people she knew who had also hit deer on that stretch of the road. Sure enough, as Karen drove down the road, she noticed an unusual movement out of the corner of her eye, back off the road a bit. She knew this road like the back of her hand, and she could easily notice anything out of the ordinary. She cursed out loud, saying something to the effect of manifesting a deer because of thinking about it just a few seconds ago. But before she could slow down or beep her horn to get its attention so it didn't run into the road, she found herself jerking back into her seat. Her reflexes had reacted to the sight of a large animal flying from up along the side of her car and landing directly in the middle of the road in front of her, directly in the line of her headlights. She immediately slammed on her brakes, but was so close to the thing at this point that she thought for sure she was going to slam into it, and she braced for impact. 
And then, like a movie in slow motion, she watched as her car came to a sliding stop, skidding sideways down the road and towards the creature, watching as it threw its arms up in the air and jumped backwards to avoid being hit. Within seconds, she came to a stop, and there she sat, in her car that was now sitting sideways in the middle of the road. All she could do was grip the steering wheel and watch as this creature, this hideous being, slowly, yet naturally, turned its head away from looking at her and walked on two legs, making its way back to the side of the road, back in the direction that it had come from. Her headlights had clearly illuminated its grotesque features. They were somewhere between that of a man and a wolf. She estimates that it was easily the size of a large bear, but that its head was disproportionately large in comparison to its body. And she described the long snout as almost sharp-looking. The fur on its back was black except along its spine, where it was a bit of a lighter brown color. And the fur on its chest and belly was lighter still. And it had a tail that looked like it was covered in fur, but she couldn't see very well once it left her headlights. And then she started to doubt that feature. But she said that the most startling thing about it was its eyes. They were bright, almost electric, and they seemed to reflect her headlights in a way that looked like they glowed in the dark. Karen sat there staring at it as it made its way back into the darkness. And only when it completely disappeared did she finally release the breath that she'd been holding. The encounter lasted all of about 15 seconds, but to her, it felt like an eternity. And then, in a move that she still doesn't understand, and second guesses to this day, she slowly drove her car off the road, off to the side, and got out. She then walked over to the area where the creature disappeared to and looked around for any clues as to what it could have been. In retrospect, she feels she needed some closure to come to terms with what had just happened. But she says it was almost like an out-of-body experience in that her brain wasn't really controlling her actions. She felt like it was instinct or some other force pulling at her. But there was nothing there. Nothing at all in the entire area that looked out of place, except for the skid marks her car made back on the road. After a bit, she decided to give up on trying to figure out what it was and started walking back to her car. She turned her back to the trees and faced her car, and that's when she heard it, the sound of twigs snapping in the trees behind her. She spun around, her heart racing, saw nothing, but knew she had to get out of there fast. She then tried to make a run for it back to the car, but before she could take even more than two steps, there it was. The creature was standing right there, in front of her again. This time it didn't jump backward like before when her car came at it. It just stood there, looking at her, with those unnerving eyes. And then the thing happened that still haunts her to this day. She heard words in her head, as if it had spoke to her. She remembers hearing a voice telling her to leave, and to never come back. She was rooted to the ground stuck there with a combination of fear and confusion rushing through her head. She couldn't understand how the creature could get in her head like that, and its voice was so unexpected that it took her a minute to even realize that she should be afraid. Very afraid. Eventually, fear and adrenaline kicked in and she tried to run for her car again, but found herself tripping over her feet, landing hard on the grass before getting anywhere. The creature seemed to be drawn to her lying there, vulnerable, and it walked over to her. It walked over until it was right next to her. She didn't dare look up at it, up at its eyes, and instead she just kept her head down and her eyes looking at its feet. The feet were rough and calloused in a way that only a wild animal would have. And then as she was processing this, the creature leaned down so that its face was only inches away from hers. She could hear it breathing, slowly and deeply, and she watched as the drool dripped from its mouth and landed on the ground next to its feet, and she could smell it too, the smell of death and rotting flesh. The entirety of it was too much for her to bear. She closed her eyes and started to pray, but before she could utter a single word, she blacked out. To this day, Karen has never been able to recall how she got there, or give a clear description of what happened after blacking out. 
She only remembers waking up in her car and finding herself sitting in the driver's seat. The first thing she did was check herself for injuries, and thankfully, all she saw were the few cuts from tripping and falling. She looked in the mirror, and her face was pale, but her eyes were black from her mascara streaming down her face. Luckily, she hadn't been harmed at all, and after looking at the clock, she determined that it had only been about 15 minutes. Her body and hands were shaking uncontrollably, but she knew she needed to get out of there. When she was finally able to get her body under control and to think, she started the car, pulled off onto the road, and continued her way home. While driving, she literally couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched, and it made her feel so uneasy that she had to pull over a few times just to calm down. She would sit and take at least a dozen deep breaths before pulling it together enough to continue, and although it was terrifying to stop the car, She had no choice, because the alternative would have surely ended in her wrecking. By the time she made it home, she'd convinced herself that the entire thing was just a dream, that she had hallucinated the creature. There's just no way that this happened, she thought. The truth just doesn't make any sense. She didn't even want to tell her husband for fear that he wouldn't believe her, and she would look even more of a lunatic. But in the end, she had no choice. Because as soon as he saw her walk in the door, he jumped up and rushed over to see what had happened. It was beyond obvious to him that something was up. Kara knew right away that she needed to tell him the entire truth to get his opinion on what she should do. When she finally summoned the courage to talk about what happened, he looked at her with a seriousness that made her regret ever telling him in the first place. But instead, he said that he did believe her and that he had an idea of what it could be. He told her about a creature he had heard of as a boy that was known as the Mothman. He told her that it was a creature that had been seen throughout the Appalachian Mountains, and that it was known to be very aggressive. It usually preyed on small animals, but there have been cases where it has attacked people as well. Well, that was a creature that Karen had never heard of, but after hearing about it, she figured it was possible even though its description did not match at all what she saw. Together, they chose not to tell anybody else about the incident for fear of being ridiculed and laughed at. They didn't even call the police. She and he both did some research online, and other possible creatures popped up on various sites. Bigfoot? Werewolf? They're not sure. But her memory of it all was becoming more and more unsteady, too almost like the memories of scary stories you hear as a kid, or the memories of scary experiences. They're still there, but you wonder if your brain embellished parts and made them worse than they really were. Karen says that it still scares her to think about that day, and that she sometimes has nightmares in which she's being chased by the creature. She also says that to this day she has no idea exactly what it was, and that she's not even sure if it was really there, or just a product of her imagination. One thing that has definitely changed, though, is that after decades of driving that road to work, she now takes a different route altogether. She can't even get near the area without starting to violently shake. I work for a security firm, a very professional one. We aren't like Blackwater or any of those other mercenary bands, but we have our share of ex-military and law enforcement, even a few combat vets. We're thoroughly trained and, depending on the contract, considerably well-armed. A few months ago, I was assigned to a nondescript building on the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia. We operate all along the East Coast. We didn't receive any details on what or who we were securing. That's how I knew it was a government job. Private contractors usually get hired when the government wants to keep something under wraps. Half a dozen guys in generic black clothing draw a hell of a lot less attention than fully uniformed military. We were better trained than 80% of them anyway. Patrol patterns, access controls, and screenings were what we were responsible for. The building was large. It seemed like a repurposed hospital but updated and sterile. The property was expansive, too, but it had an eight-foot-high chain-link fence, 
and the grounds were under constant CCTV surveillance. We didn't find any of this the least bit odd. Pretty commonplace practice, really, in this line of work. There was a roster of about 30 personnel who routinely worked in the building. I recognized all of them and knew a few well enough to have brief conversations. But it was always idle chit-chat. None of them ever revealed any information about the site, and I never asked. Until recently, we had hardly received any visitors. But now, well, over the past two weeks, it's been really steady. From military higher-ups, doctors, and various government agencies. I was typically on perimeter patrol, and I preferred it that way. Fresh air, no matter how cold, always kept me on my toes. And that's what I was doing the night it happened. The building had been a buzz of activity all day. Record number of visitors and the first time I had seen military vehicles so overtly enter the grounds. We had gotten word earlier that the contract was coming to an end, and I was going to be reassigned somewhere in Philadelphia. Rumors about the police force there bringing us on for some extra muscle. The building had wound down at this point with only a skeleton crew of five or six left inside, plus nine other security personnel. They had doubled us up over the last few days. So it was about 10.30 at night, and I only had another 90 minutes left on my shift. I was on the eastern edge of the grounds doing a routine check of the fence line when my walkie blared out into the silence. All security was being called to the main entry room. The voice spoke frantically, and I couldn't make out who was speaking. I started trotting towards the front of the building when I heard an alarm start blaring inside. It sounded like a fire alarm. I double-timed it, and I could see another guard running from the west edge of the perimeter. Right before I reached the door, it flew open, and two women wearing lab coats burst through the entryway, running down the steps right past me. They didn't stop to talk. The other guard caught up on me, and together we moved into the building. Multiple alarms were going off all inside the building, and the overhead sprinkler system had been set off. Water was pouring down on the tops of our heads. We made our way to the entry point and linked up with five of our guys. Three were missing. None of us knew what was going on, and we were under strict orders not to cross past the entry point unless directed to do so by building personnel. And then two gunshots from the hallway past the door were followed by a scream of pain which was cut short abruptly. Order or not, this is what we were here for. And so we moved into the hallway, leaving one man back to guard the door. The hallway was clean and sterile like you would see in an intensive care ward. We were unfamiliar with this part of the building, and when we came to a junction, we split into two groups. I took the north corridor with two other guards and we made our way down the hallway meticulously checking each room. Most were empty, but others had what looked like medical equipment stored neatly on shelves or covered by tarps. As we neared the end of the hallway, we came upon a set of double doors that crashed open, slamming into the walls beside. And then a body came soaring down the hallway, slamming into the guard next to me. I raised my AR to the doorway in response, but nothing trained me for what came barreling through. Calling them human would be a stretch, but three of them came crashing through the door after the body. Each was nine feet tall with gray-green skin, and they were completely nude but bore no signs of gender. Their bodies were lean, and a maze of veins ran along each of their limbs. They had human faces, but they were devoid of any type of hair. One of the three had a tangle of tubes and wires trailing after it, but the other two riddled with scars and gaping holes on their torsos. As soon as they saw us, they rushed. I was able to get a single shot off, and I watched it soar through the chest of the first one. It didn't even break stride. The last thing I remember then was my head slamming into the hallway wall. I woke up on a military base about 30 miles from where we had been. I immediately knew I was concussed, and I couldn't stand. It was a long time before anyone came to see me, and when they did, it wasn't the least bit enlightening. There was no explanation as to what I had seen or what those things were. 
Nobody would even formally acknowledge that I had been engaged in any type of combat at all. I did receive fair medical treatment, but that was it. Eventually, one of my superiors from the firm came to see me and let me know that I was being placed on temporary leave until I recovered and could return to duty. After I got home, I tried reaching out to a few of the other contractors I knew, but still, I haven't been able to get in touch with any of them. Once this story gets out, I'm sure they'll know who blew the whistle. I don't know what will happen to me, and at this point, it doesn't really matter. We need to tell people what I saw. We need to let them know that the government is performing some kind of experiment, creating some kind of weapon. So, I'm not a believer in the supernatural or things like Bigfoot or anything like that. Or, at least, I wasn't. But I might be now. I don't know. A few weeks ago, I saw something, and I'm going crazy trying to figure it out. I think I might have hallucinated it or maybe mistook a common animal for this thing. I don't know, but I feel like I'm losing my mind. So I came here to get some help. A few weeks ago, I was out taking a walk late at night. This was around October 18th or so, and it was like 10 o'clock at night. I live in a decent area on the outskirts of Columbus, Ohio, but it's a little messy right now because of some improvements with some new houses being built. Across from where my street comes off the main road, there's this series of abandoned buildings that are in the process of being demolished. Behind these buildings is a wooded area. Wildlife in our area largely consists of deer, birds, and a few stray cats, so nothing crazy. I'm familiar with the layout and the area. I like walking there because it's calm and quiet, away from highways and everything. So I'm walking around like I usually do, sometimes kicking a brick or a stone, when I hear something to the right of me, where the woods are. It sounded like bricks or something fell off of a wall, which could have been caused by wind or a stray cat, so I honestly wasn't concerned. At least I wasn't concerned until I heard the noise again, but this time it was closer to me, and then I had this feeling like I was in a fishbowl, like I was being watched. I was really freaked out, but I tried to keep myself calm, and I just kept thinking there had to be a logical explanation. Like I said, we don't have any notable wildlife to be afraid of, and I go here all the time. So I take out my phone and I turn on the flashlight and I head towards the noises. I hear them again, but this time it's further from me, which seemingly confirmed, in the weird way that my brain was working, that this was a stray cat or something. I then feel less scared as I maneuver around debris and cinder blocks. It was cold outside, so I was trying to walk quickly. And then I reach the tree line and I see this thing. It looked sort of like a human-like creature, like Gollum from Lord of the Rings. Its skin was pale, but white, like a birch tree. And it was crawling on all fours, and it was completely naked. It had large black eyes that seemed empty, but intelligent, like it understood what was happening. It even tilted its head as though it was confused, or maybe curious. It didn't have a nose, and its mouth... Its mouth was like a slit carved into the face. After what felt like forever, it just ran off into the woods. This thing looked so human, but so alien at the same time, and it moved impossibly fast. I mean, I don't know that I've ever seen something that size move that fast. I felt nauseous, and I basically ran home, which was only about ten minutes away from that spot. I couldn't sleep that night because I just kept seeing this ghoulish human creature. I didn't say anything to anybody because I was afraid. What would they think? What if I had just mistaken a dog or something and my brain was stressed and couldn't comprehend what I had seen? So the next night, I went out again, about the same time. This time, though, I did bring a knife with me just in case. So I made my way down to the tree line and I waited to see if it would come out again. But it never did. And then I did this for a few days, each day disappointed. I eventually stopped because at this point I was positive I had imagined this thing. While I was driving home from work one night, and this would have been about a week after the initial encounter, 
when something ran in front of my car. Slammed on the brakes and in the middle of the road, staring right at me, was this same creature. I get chills just thinking about it. The eyes were so empty and calculating, and it was as though it understood that I was in the car, as if it had remembered me. It wasn't frozen like a deer that usually looks startled and confused when caught in the headlights. It looked as though it chose to be there. And then it stood up. I swear this is the creepiest thing I have ever seen. It stood up and its arms and legs were long, unusually so. And it just looked at me. It must have been six feet tall at this point. And I felt as though it were staring into my soul. I nearly peed my pants. My heart was racing, and I had never been this scared in my life. I watched as it walked off into the tree line. It walked off like a human. At some point, I found it in me to start driving again. My hands were now shaking, and I felt sick and weak as I was driving. In the side mirrors, I saw it again, galloping alongside my car. I mean, it was running on all fours now like a dog. And I was going maybe 10 or 15 miles an hour at this point. So that's pretty fast for it to go. As it ran, it made this weird noise, like this clicking sound. So I sped up until I couldn't see it any longer. Now, at this point, I've told some people they think I'm crazy. I think I'm crazy. Some people believe me, but I have no evidence that this thing exists or that I saw it. I mean, there are no tracks, nothing. I could really use all of your help because I can't rest until I know what that creature is. I have never been able to shake what happened to me. My parents have always told me it was just a dream, but I know it wasn't. I was 10 years old and I was spending the night at my grandparents' house in Oklahoma. It was New Year's Day and we had spent New Year's Eve there celebrating, but my parents went home and I had wanted to stay. You see, my grandparents had this huge bin of army men with vehicles and all kinds of accessories. It was one of my favorite things to play with since I was really little, and I didn't want to stop playing with them at the time. My grandpa had bought them at a special store that sold historically accurate figures. They were highly detailed with detailed and accurate tanks as well. I had set them up for one giant war in the living room, American and British soldiers using my shoes as a mountain base. The Germans were using the entertainment center as their base, with artillery cannons and tanks guarding the outside. I had set up a sleeping bag in the room, too, with a pillow so that when I got tired, I'd sleep in there, and then continue playing when I woke up. At some point, I got tired and laid down on the sleeping bag, admiring the setup that I had made. I dozed off. I know I did because I had fought it for so long until I basically fell over. I woke suddenly, though, covered in sweat and panicking for some reason. I had no idea why, but I soon realized that the room was covered in this bright light, so bright that I had to shield my eyes with my arm, and there were yellow and red lights as well, flashing and far less bright than the white light. I could see it through the window on the door out towards the backyard. I ran and hid in the kitchen, poking my head out to continue seeing what was going on. And that's when I saw some sort of figure moving through the light. I then ran from my grandparents' room, and I tried to wake them up. I shook them, and I called for them, but neither would wake up. I don't know if it was because of the light, like maybe they had been put in a trance, or what was happening, but they would not wake up. I then ran back into the kitchen. As a kid, I didn't know what else to do, and I noticed that the back door handle was now turning back and forth. Something was trying to get in. I couldn't see what it was, though, because the window was covered with a curtain, and I was too afraid to open it. As it turned out, I didn't have to. I soon heard the front door handle shaking as well, and I peeked into the living room, over to the front of the house, and that's when I saw it through the window of the front door. It was this blue-gray thing with large black eyes, and it was shaking the door handle, trying to get in the house. I was absolutely terrified, and then I ran back to the kitchen and hid under the kitchen table, thinking that nobody would find me there. I could still hear the back and the front door handles shaking. 
the light pouring into the family room and parts of the kitchen. I covered my ears and I closed my eyes and I screamed as loud as I could, but the noise and the lights didn't stop. So I grabbed a flashlight. I don't know why. Maybe I thought I could use it as a weapon. But then I ran over and pulled the curtain back and shone the light out the kitchen door and into the thing's eyes. It seemed startled because it brought its eyes up to look at me, but didn't otherwise move. And when it went to hold its hand up to the door, I kind of lost it. I instinctively swung the flashlight, smashing the window of the back door, and the thing ran towards the bright light further back in the yard. I could see other things, shadow figures, moving from the front yard as well, back towards the light that was shining in the back. That's all I remember. I woke up the next day under the kitchen table. I refused to leave. My grandparents found me there and tried to get me to come out. They then called my parents to come over, but all I could do was hug my legs and rock back and forth. My grandfather and dad went outside to look around. There had to be some other reason for what I had experienced that night. They were out there a long time, and my grandma and my mom tried to calm me down. When the guys came back in, they shared a look, and then turned to my mother and grandmother. They were all whispering but I could hear them say something about weird tracks outside and grass in the field that was folded over. They decided to call the sheriff and have him come to take a look. He spoke to me under the table and asked my mom to give me paper and crayons to draw what I had seen. He then searched our yard with some of his deputies. I drew the lights and the strange blue-gray things that were trying to get in the house. When the sheriff came back in, he spoke to my father and grandfather in the other room. I could hear their voices, but not what they were saying. He came back into the kitchen and looked at my drawings, told me they were really good, but he didn't seem to believe what I had told him. He told my parents that I probably saw a truck with fog lights on. The rest probably came from being alone in an unfamiliar room at night. Happens to kids all the time. What he didn't know is... I always did this. I eventually came out from under the table a few hours after the sheriff left. I couldn't sleep for weeks, and my parents eventually brought me to a psychiatrist. I spent many months there, but I knew what I saw. It was not just a dream or the illusion of a young child. I wasn't always a believer in the paranormal. But my family and I unknowingly moved into a haunted house. The experiences I had there changed my perspective forever. It's easy to say that there's no such thing as ghosts because it's nearly impossible to prove it. But once you experience it directly, there is no denying it. Not only did I feel the presence of a ghost, but I also felt threatened and violated by it. I always thought people were making up stories when they talked about their experiences, but now I'm passionate about the paranormal. There's no way I could tell you everything that happened in that house, but there are a few things that I feel compelled to share with you. Spirits are not to be antagonized and messed with. We need to treat them with respect. We need to learn how to live amongst them instead of denying their existence. When we first moved into the house, we all thought it was perfect. It was big enough that all the kids had their own bedroom. The kitchen was enormous, and the views were spectacular. It was right by the harbor in Massachusetts, and you could see hundreds of boats of all types traveling through. There were beautiful ocean views as far as you could see, and I'll never forget the smell of seawater that you got when you cracked the window open. It seemed too good to be true at first. My room was massive, and it had the most intricate carvings in the wood all around the room. I had never seen anything so beautiful. The first week we stayed there, we didn't have beds or anything, but I didn't care. I was just so happy to finally have my own room. Slowly but surely, we started to move furniture in, and it started to feel like home. One night, my brother and I were roughhouse playing, and we knocked a mirror off the wall. It shattered all over the floor. My mom made us go to our rooms for an hour just to calm us down, but it wasn't long before I could hear my brother running up and down the hallway. I just knew my mom was going to freak out at both of us, and I was probably going to be the one to get in trouble for his behavior. 
I timed it so that his footsteps were right outside my door, and I swung my door open to smack into him. I looked out into the hallway. There wasn't anybody there. Convinced that my brother must have run into his own room, I ran to his door and swung it open. I found him fast asleep in bed. And then I heard the footsteps again. And when I looked, there was nobody there. I remember my hair stood on end and it freaked me out so badly. I went back to my room and tried to sleep, but barely did. Later that night, I was startled awake, but I didn't know by what. So I started to sit up in bed and I squinted into the darkness only to see this dark figure leaning over me. I tried to scream, but I couldn't make a sound. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. And it felt like hands were on my chest holding me down. I tried as hard as possible to make a sound, but I could only shake in the bed. Finally, I was released. I screamed for my parents. They ran in to check on me and told me that I was just having a bad dream. I told them it wasn't a dream, and that a dark figure was forcing me to stay on the bed. They told me there was no such thing as ghosts or spirits. They assured me that it was just a bad dream and encouraged me to get back to sleep. I was awake the whole night, staring at the foot of the bed. And then a few days later, I heard my mom and dad fighting over who was leaving the tub running. They both claimed to not use the tub, they only used the shower. So this became a common argument, and soon, every member of the family was getting blamed for leaving the tub running. My dad even got so mad one night that he shut the water off to the tub completely. A couple of minutes afterwards, we were all in the bathroom arguing about who the guilty one was when the faucet turned on completely by itself. My mom asked, who's there? And the lights in the bathroom turned off. We screamed. We ran. A little while after that, it was my birthday. We were celebrating with cake. My mom told me to make a wish and then blow out the candles. I made the wish, took a deep breath, but before I could blow them out, all the candles on the cake went out, and a pair of candles from the mantelpiece lit up. We all just sat there looking at the candles until my dad grabbed them and threw them into the garbage. We then just ate the cake and tried to pretend nothing had happened. Many years later, we looked the house up, and it turned out that a man who lived there previously had killed his wife, and then himself. It had made the local newspaper. One day, I'd love to compile a list of all my family's experiences there as well as the experiences of anybody else who lived there and had the same experiences. It was crazy, and being in a place like that will turn anybody into a believer.